We need to know the rule. Simple and straightforward. It is two free throws, always, always two free throws to the offended player or their substitute if they were injured and the ball to the team at the spot nearest the foul. Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Basketball Rules Expert, the YouTube show where we take National Federation of High School rules off the printed page, breathe life, simplify, clarify, amplify, give them back to you in a way that you can take with you onto the basketball court. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin. I've been a high school basketball official for over a decade, and I consider myself to be a basketball rules expert. This show is all about helping you on your journey to becoming a basketball rules expert as well. Today we're going to try something fun. We're going to have a lightning round show. We're going to go through questions super quickly and get the answers because we need immediate answers in these scenarios. But before we do, I'd like to thank our show supporters. Robert Lloyd, Peter Blum, Matthew Wynn, and super supporter Tim Robinson. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to support the show, there's a link in the show notes below. Today, we're going to get started with our lightning round show. Quick questions, quick answers, not a deep dive into the rules, just an emphasis on the things that we need to know. While A1 is attempting a three-point try, A1 is fouled by B1. The officials rule an intentional foul on B1. The try is successful. The officials award one free throw to A1 and the ball to Team A for a throw-in. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, super simple question. Intentional foul in National Federation of High School Basketball rules. What is the penalty? This also applies to a flagrant foul. The penalty is the same. Two free throws and the ball to the offended player or their eligible substitute at the spot nearest the foul, except one instance, three-point try that is missed. In that instance, three tries for free throw. We need to know the rule, simple and straightforward. It is two free throws, always, always two free throws to the offended player or their substitute if they were injured and the ball to the team at the spot nearest the foul. Ding! The one exception is if the three-point try is missed. If it's missed, it's three tries for free throw. To the player or their substitute, and the ball for throw-in at the spot of the foul. It applies to intentional fouls. It applies to flagrant fouls. All the same, simple, straightforward. So in our instance here, the try was successful. Natural inclination is and one, but we know what the penalty is. So in this instance, were the officials correct? Yes or no? The answer is no. The officials were not correct. As time expires in the fourth quarter, with the score tied, player A1 is fouled in the act of shooting. Team B head coach is granted a timeout. Before the timeout, Team A head coach requests a timeout. The officials deny the timeout request. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? This is a funky part of the rules book. End of the game. After time has expired, the game has not ended, but after time has expired, there is a rule that you, we will not allow successive timeouts. And that is defined in the rules book as a second timeout after time has expired. It's an odd quirk of the rules. It is what it is. The officials were correct in not allowing a successive timeout at the after time had expired in the game. It's important to know that that is the clarifier. After time has expired, not that the game has ended, but after time has expired, 
we will not allow successive timeouts to be granted. So in this instance, were the officials correct? Yes. Yes, they were. A1 requests a timeout while airborne, holding the ball and heading out of bounds. The officials grant the timeout request. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? A fact of life for high school basketball officials is that the stakeholders in the game, our partners, ourselves, we're fans of basketball. We watch basketball. We watch NBA basketball. We watch collegiate basketball. The rule sets in those different levels of play can be different. And that understanding of what the rules are sometimes bleeds down into high school, right? So this, uh, this by rule, a player heading out of bounds, holding the ball, requesting a timeout shall not be granted in collegiate officiating. I believe men's, NCAA men's has that rule, but that doesn't apply to high school. A player holding the ball can request a timeout. Absolutely. There's no restriction that they cannot be in the process of having their momentum carry this off the court. Were the officials correct? Yes. Yes, they were. A1 has the ball for a throw-in when B1 reaches through the boundary plane and fouls A1. The officials rule a player technical foul on B1. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? It's an atypical play, one that can catch us off guard. Easy to remember, though. During a throw-in, when a defensive player contacts the thrower, by rule, it is an intentional foul. If a defensive player bakes, breaks the boundary plane and contacts the basketball, that is a player technical foul. In this instance, the officials should have ruled an intentional foul on B1. Were the officials correct? No. No, they weren't. Team A substitute A12 enters and plays the second period. At halftime, the official scorekeeper notices that A12 is not in the scorebook and informs the officials. The officials rule an administrative technical foul and start the third period with free throws. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Logically, this seems to be correct, but we have to remember with technical fouls, there are periods of time that are allowed for the discovery of the technical foul. In this instance, an administrative technical foul can be assessed if it is discovered while the player is violating. If we had discovered that A12, a substitute, is not in the book while A12 is playing, administrative technical foul would be the appropriate penalty. But in this instance, we're outside of that period, and so the officials have no authority to assess the tactical foul. Should A12 come back into the game? Indeed, then that would be the appropriate time. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No, no, they were not. Thrower A1 steps on the end line during a throw-in. The officials rule a throw-in violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Sometimes reflexively, we see somebody step on a line, we think something illegal has happened, but the, the rule for a thrower is they are not allowed to step on the court. The court is begins with the inner edge of the boundary line. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No, the officials were not correct. This is a legal play. A1 dives for a loose ball on the floor. A1 slides, controls the ball, and then slides some more. The officials rule a traveling violation has occurred. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Great hustle play, player dives on the floor, controls the ball, slides some more. Before they stop, official rules of travel. The gym erupts. Everybody wants to travel. Everybody knows you can't do that. Except, yes, yes, you can do that. That is a legal play by rule. 
Were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. A1's try for goal fails to reach the basket, and A1 catches the ball while it remains airborne. The officials rule a traveling violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no. In National Federation of High School rules, it's legal for a player to catch an air ball as long as it was a try. If the officials make the judgment that it was a try for goal, then there is no longer team control and the player can catch the ball. Why would people think this is a traveling violation? Because with other rule sets, specifically the NBA, this is a violation. Right? We watch those games, we think those rules apply, and they don't. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. A1, while standing inbounds behind the backboard, shoots the ball over the backboard, and the ball passes through the basket. The officials rule this a legal play and allow the goal. Were the officials correct? Yes or no. In National Federation of High School Rules, if we're dealing with a rectangular backboard, the ball cannot pass over the backboard legally. By rule, this is an illegal play, out of bounds violation should have been ruled. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No, no they were not. The existence of other rule sets, right? We see a highlight from an NBA game, and in the NBA game, they allow the goal. In National Federation of High School rules, this is illegal, it is a violation, and the goal should not be scored. A1 throws the ball from the backcourt and hits the official who is in the front court. The ball rebounds to the backcourt and is recovered by A2. The officials rule this to be a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no. A1 throws the ball from the backwards, all right? So that means that they are in bounds. They are holding the ball. We have team control on the court. A1 throws the ball to the front court, hits the official, and the ball bounds back into the backcourt where A2 recovers the ball. This errant pass hit the official, stayed on the court. A2 collected it, right? What do we need to understand? Status, the status of the ball. The ball, when it was in the backcourt, it has backcourt status. The ball, when it's thrown, still has backcourt status. When the ball contacts the official who is in contact with the front court, the ball gains front court status. Then the ball goes into the backcourt where A2 collects the ball. The team has caused the ball to go from the backcourt to the front court and back to the backcourt without a player touching the ball. This is a backcourt violation by rule. Were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. A1 attempts a field goal. The ball hits the rim, then hits the top of the backboard, and then passes through the basket. The officials rule this a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no. Obviously, the backboard it has six sides. It has the front side. It has the back side. It has the left side, the right side, the top side, and the bottom side. Only one of those sides is out of play, is out of bounds, and that is the back side. So a ball that contacts the top of the backboard can obviously remain in play by rule. Were the officials correct? Yes. Yes, they were. A2 deflects a ball passed by A1. A2's momentum carries him or her out of bounds. A2 then returns to the court, grabs the ball, and scores. The officials rule this a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? A1 passes to A2. A2 deflects the ball, but their momentum carries them out of bounds. They immediately return to the court, grab the ball, and score. Was that a legal play? Yes, by rule, a legal play. All we need to do is establish inbound status, and that is achieved by having a part of their body touching the playing court and nothing touching out of bounds. 
So once the player has legal inbound status, there is no restriction against grabbing the ball and scoring. So were the officials correct? Yes. Yes, they were. Thanks for joining us today on Basketball Rules Expert YouTube show. If you find this content to be valuable, let's do all the things. Let's like, subscribe, notify, and make sure to share the show with other officials who could find value. Again, we owe a debt of gratitude to our show supporters, Robert, Peter, Matthew, and Tim. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to support the show, you can always buy us a coffee. There's a link above and in the show notes below. We'll have these questions from the lightning round in question form back at the website, abetterofficial.com. There's a link above and in the show notes below. And as always, we have additional video content for you here. Make your choice, choose wisely, and we'll see you in the very next video. Take care.